As we continue our study through the book of Hebrews, our scripture reading this morning comes from Hebrews chapter 2, verses 10 through 18. It says this, For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. This is God's word. Uh, today we're going to uh, continue our study in Hebrews chapter 2. This is written to Hebrews. Remember the name of the book, Hebrews. And because of that, there are three types of audiences that are Hebrews. There are believers, young believers. There are fence riders, those who have intellectually con uh, conceded some points about Jesus' messianic um, claims. But also there are, um, but they're still unbelievers. They haven't wholeheartedly given over to the Lordship of Christ. And then there are those who are still hostile towards the faith. So when we have these parentheticals, like we covered a few weeks ago at the beginning of Hebrews chapter 2, we have to be mindful of those three audiences. And then it is, he is making strategic warnings to specific audiences that are inside of that. The theme is this, as it is on the screen, Jesus is better. And last week, uh, we, we came to this port, portion of our service where we recognized that Christ became a man so that he could die. He came to die. Now, that's not popular in modern evangelical um, churches. Uh, and when we say modern, we mean those who are more in the antinomian realm uh, not talking about the cross, not talking about the blood, and so forth. So that's not really a popular statement to make. The very fact that Christ became a man because he had to die. Until he became a man, he could have never died because he's eternal God. But by being truly God and truly man, meaning Jesus is the essence of eternal deity. And at the same time, he is the essence of sinless humanity. It is the incarnation. This doctrine that is, that is really spelled out by the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 2. It is telling us that Christ was able because of the incarnation to die in our place. To bear our sins in a real body in which God had prepared for him in order that he might be our Savior. And this should be beautiful. This should be enough. The question is begged and asked, do we truly believe in the gospel? And if we do, then we need to recognize today and proclaim to a lost and dying world, but not just to a lost and dying world, pro but proclaim to each other Jesus, therefore, is fully capable of saving you. He is fully capable, and we should be comforted as believers in that. And so last week, we left with this one statement, and it is this. Every person that experiences, because of the incarnation, every person that experiences God's wrath is completely deserving of his wrath. 
And every person that experiences God's mercy is completely undeserving of his mercy. With that in mind, it has been read, I feel like it would be appropriate for us to at least read the first part of verse 10 as we are now springboarding in. And Lord willing, today we may finish this chapter. If not, it's like baloney. We'll cut it off where we need to and we'll start back next week with it. In verse 10, For it was fitting that he, and that is speaking of the Father, God, For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make. Can we stop there for a moment? It was was fitting. that, That phrase means that it was right according to God's very character. In the fullness of his glory, whatever is about to transpire, It was going to bring the absolute most possible glory and shine the brightest light on the very character of God. See, a lot of times people ask this very question and it's actually kind of arrogant if you really think about it. Could God have saved us another way? That's the question that is asked. Have you ever wondered that? When you think about the crucifixion of Jesus and you think about the suffering in which this scripture even shines more light on, when you think about that, have you ever gotten to the place and you say, I wonder why didn't he just do it another way? And the answer is this. Because this way was going to bring the most glory and show the most of his character and give him the most honor and the most praise. It was going to show the very heart of God. There was no other way. And we need to, we need to really hunker down with that truth. It's not, well, if God had wanted to do it another way, he could have done it another way. We need to understand, you know, the, those, those rec- reckless questions, you know, can God make a stone that he can't pick up, you know, and so forth. And the thing is, is that why would he do that? Because why would he do something that is contrary to his nature and contrary to his character and contrary to his glory? And that is, and we need to understand this, God always does What gives him most glory. And when that takes place, that means that God always does what is best for this world. God's glory is best for this world. So this phrase, it was fitting that he, speaking of the Father... And how do we know it's speaking of the Father? Because of this Old Testament reference here. It says everything consists and is accomplished for his supreme glory. For for whom and by whom. So you need to understand this world turns for God's glory. But you also need to understand that this world doesn't turn without God. God is literally holding everything together. And that phrase, it says, and I love this. We sing that song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. In bringing many sons to glory. We could stop there for a while. Sons, that is speaking of the elect. That is speaking of the church. That is speaking of those who are genuine believers in the gospel. Because of that, as we're going to go, we're going to move forward. We have been adopted into the family and bringing many sons so that so that can be a reference to the church or it can just be a reference to the sons of Adam okay so bringing many sons to glory now I know that many of us have heard many songs and it talks about going to heaven and what do they say you know moving up to glory oh glory You know, and so moving up to glory, but you need to understand today, that's not what that is talking about. It's not talking, bringing many sons to heaven. It's talking about literally bringing mankind, bringing humankind back to the glory of its original intent of being in dominion over this world and over all things. 
Adam ruined that. We talked about that last week. The last Adam chose. He wanted to live. And what did he do? He brought death. But through the, through the last Adam. Who, who, brought, who sought death and brought life. Now there is going to be a group of people. A people Brought unto himself for the glory of God. That are going to be brought back into dominion over this world. And back into dominion over everything. Paul said this. Do you not know that you will, be rule, you will rule over angels? We will, we will be charged and we will be brought to our glory. That word bringing means, and I love this. It is a legal term. It's not just a casual invite. Okay, It is the picture of someone legally escorting someone out of the courtroom. Someone who has authority. And what they do, I mean, you ever had somebody where, or you watch a TV show and so forth, and someone is, the, the sentence has been given, whether it's guilty or innocent, and what happens? Even then, they are what? Escorted out of the courtroom. This picture here is a picture of Christ legally coming and escorting his children or his, his brothers, as we're going to see in a moment, out of the courtroom, out of the presence of the judge and into the presence of the Father. But this gives us a little snapshot of what, what is to come in this text. It says, the, should make the founder of their salvation, that is speaking of the Son now, perfect through suffering. Now, this word perfect is, is by a lot of heretics will, will try to imply that Jesus was incomplete or that Jesus was sinless and then he was then made perfect. Perfect, but this word perfected here, and the English language doesn't give it really its justice. It means tested. It means that through the life of Christ, he was tested and validated through what? Suffering. All the claims that were made by Christ were validated to this world through his suffering. Jesus didn't just come and perch on a throne. And assume and, and, and demand all allegiance to him. He came as Philippians chapter 2 says. And he humbled himself. And became a servant. And in the next verse. Verse 11 says. For he speaking of the son. Who sanctifies. And those who are sanctified. All of one source. We'll come back to that in a moment. That. Is why he, being the son, is not ashamed to call them brothers. While some, some scholars have viewed this as a complete work now, as introducing the father, the son, and here, believing this he at the beginning is speaking of the Holy Spirit, some view this to be the completed work of the Trinity. But contextually... The way the writer consistently uses these terms related to sanctification in the book of Hebrews. It's particularly like Hebrews chapter 10 where he points to the body of Christ being our sanctification. And several other texts in this letter. And we'll get to those in the coming Sundays. That he that is spoken of here who sanctifies is confirmed by the next he. Okay, so read it again. For he who sanctifies, those who are sanctified, all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. So we must remember that the point of the writer is not centered on the Holy Spirit. The point of the writer and the highlight that the writer is making here is pointing us to the Son. Let me make it very clear, though, concerning the Holy Spirit. The Bible does teach us that the, Holy, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to sanctify the believer. Romans chapter 15 verse 16 says, um, teaches that a person is sanctified by the Holy Spirit. It is a working ministry of the Spirit. Meaning, and I want you to understand this. Sanctification begins when the gospel is preached... The, the seed takes root 
And the Holy Spirit brings you forward. That means this. Here's the ramification. And I think that reality validates this. And I believe you would agree. That many will hear thousands of sermons. In fact, today, you can hear thousands of sermons. You can be stirred emotionally. You can even change your mind intellectually. But if the power of the Holy Spirit isn't flowing out from God's grace and opening the person's heart to literally receiving the gospel, according to Acts chapter 16, that person will not be saved. Sanctification happens when the gospel is preached and the Spirit of God pours out His power into that human heart. The Spirit carries out and is made, and but, okay, so the Spirit has a ministry of sanctification, but what this writer is focusing on here is none of that is possible without the Son. Because there is no gospel without the Son. The passive point here is to make the audience aware that now sanctification is not only possible, but has happened in the mind of God. Did you catch the tense? Sanctified. In the minds of God. The word sanctified, it means to be made holy. In the mind of God, because of him looking and imputing Christ's righteousness on you. He's not living in a moment to moment saying, okay, you're still a little dirty. No, he's looking at you and he is seeing his son. And in his mind, he is saying, holy, declared righteous in my sight. But all of that in the mind of God is only done because of the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Which brings us to our main focus. This writer now gives three beautiful titles and examples of who Jesus is in the life of the believer. And I pray today that this isn't just spread, spreading of the gospel in the sense of evangelistic, although it is. But I pray today that this causes you to pause and find even more beauty in this gospel that we claim to believe in. He calls him, number one, a great champion. In verse 10 it says, But it was fitting that he, the Father... For whom and by whom all things consist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation. The there is us. The there is the church. Their salvation. But the founder there, is it's a beautiful word. It can come and we can gather the word um, in the Greek as author. Okay. Or... um, It actually is where we get our English word, entrepreneur. It is is one who initiates, who takes something and now where where there was a need, there was an individual that recognized the need and through his own resources, he then developed a product Or a task or a trade to fill that need. And we need to understand today that Jesus and Jesus alone is the entrepreneur of your salvation. You are not the entrepreneur of your salvation. You are not the author of your salvation. You can feed the poor, you can help the sick, you can take care of the elderly, you can even adopt a million orphans. But you need to understand all of that is filthy rags in the eyes of God. Why? Because all your righteousness in and of itself is contaminated with a sin nature that is, that is in direct opposition to the very nature and character of a righteous and holy God. Jesus is the founder of salvation. 
Jesus is the author of salvation. Jesus is the entrepreneur of salvation. But also, this is a, a this Greek word was also used in that time as a as a as a war term or a battle term or a military term. Some actually prefer to interpret this as should make the champion of their salvation. If we go back to the Old Testament, we see a picture of of champion versus champion fighting. Oftentimes throughout history, rather than having wars amongst thousands, nations that were in hostility towards one another would choose their greatest champion. And they would combat for the rights of the nation. And the, the, the defeated nation would become slaves to the victors. We see a picture of that in the Old Testament, don't we? Big giant that comes and defies God and his army. He is their champion and the Philistines say, bring us your champion and let him go up against our champion. And nobody in Israel could stand. This is a picture for us of why you have to read the Old Testament in light of Christ. Because this is the sermon that you may hear. Who in here is going to be a David? And stand up for God's people. And stand up for God's work. We need to understand in that narrative, we're not David. We're the Israelites that are cowering. And are afraid. And are just fine with that champion standing there. Jesus is David. Jesus And do you see the beauty of the messianic promise? David was an unlikely champion. He was the one that when everybody looked at him, remember Samuel comes and he says, Jesse, one of them's going to be the king. Well, he brought his strongest. He brought his oldest. He brought the next oldest. And he goes all the way down. And he says, is this all you got? Because the Spirit of the Lord says that this isn't going to be the means. This isn't going to be the... None of these are going to be the king. He says, yeah, I got one more. He's out in the field tending to the dumb sheep. But he's scrawny. He's unlikely. Surely you don't mean him. He said, bring him to him. Man looketh on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. And he anointed him to be king of Israel. But David against Goliath was an unlikely champion. You say, you say Blake, why is there significance there? Because the prophecy said that they would turn their head and totally look over Jesus when he was here. He was the unlikely champion. He's the one when he could have in all his heavenly authority come in on a white horse and he could have sacked Rome with one word. And he could have declared all of them to bow. And yet, humbly, he comes into Jerusalem in fulfillment of the prophecy riding in on a donkey. To not even have a place to lay his head. An unlikely champion. But we know. That oh he was. The great champion. David. Conquered. A giant. A physical giant. Between nine and ten foot tall. But Jesus. Slayed the giant. Of sin. And he conquered death, hell, and the grave for us. He is our great champion. If we move forward now, let's go to our second. The great elder brother. In verse 14 it says this. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood. Can we stop there? What does that mean? That the children 
of God share in flesh and blood with Jesus. Jesus was not an angel. Jesus was a man. He came, he lived, he died, he suffered. And he came sharing the flesh and blood. So here we see that Jesus Christ is the sanctifier and true believers are the sanctified. And get this, we are now, as it says, we he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has power of death. That is the devil. We'll come back to that in a moment. And deliver all those through the fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. It says that he was of the same source. That means literally better translated. It means that we are all under the same Father. We are from the same Father. The audience may have been, this may have been a little uh, foreign to the audience and their con- concept of the messianic promise. And they may have found it hard to conceive that the Messiah would call them brothers. Would call them brothers. So what the writer does is he then cites the Old Testament once again. Remember, these are Hebrews, so the Old Testament is vital for them. As he is talking and sharing the gospel to them. And in verse 12 it says, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children of God has given me. I want you to get this. We went from being orphans to now being adopted children of the Father because of the elder brother. Because of the elder brother. Now, you will find this interesting, I believe, that Jesus never proclaimed the disciples to be his brothers. He referenced a, 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 a brothers and sisters and mothers and talked about how he was dividing himself from his physical family in Luke. But the first thing that he tells Mary when he rose from the dead, he said, go and tell my brothers. Go and tell my brothers. It is done. Those that were given to me before the foundations of the earth. They are atoned for. They are now declared righteous before God. And now no longer when they pray to the Father will they pray in fear of a judge. But they pray to him as Paul said as Abba Father. Whereby we cry Abba Father. The elder brother. Now, we see examples in the scriptures of bad older brothers, don't we? We can go through the Old Testament. Esau wasn't a great older brother. What about the brothers of Joseph? What about David's brothers? When he, when he was so passionate about standing up for God and his people... His brother said, you're just being prideful and arrogant. Go get back in the field. You're worthless. You're not the champion. You're not worthy to even be here. In fact, the only reason you're here is because you just want to see bloodshed. We can go throughout the scriptures. But Jesus, as we've pointed out before, gave a parable. It has been given the name, the prodigal son. More appropriately, the, the title should be the lost sons. And without going into great details, because I believe we could spend an entire sermon on it. But you remember the story that the younger son goes to his father and says, give me thine inheritance. Basically, he says, I would rather you be dead and I have my riches than you be alive and me be with you. Selfishly, he does that and the father gives him what he asks. And he goes off into the far country and he spends it on on prostitutes and gambling. And he wastes all of his inheritance. While there was one brother that stayed home. He worked in the fields. He, He did everything that the father had asked to his own testament. And the father loved both his sons. And he waited 
The Bible, he says that he waited for the son. And then, remember the younger son, because we're not going to emphasize the younger son very much. But he, he came to himself eating the slop from the, from the pig pen. And he, he says, even my father's servants eat better than this. And he said, I'll go back and I'll try to make restitution with my father. I'll try to earn back everything that I've lost. Just to try to make it up to him. And as he's walking down, you can visualize the silhouette and the sun broken, beaten down by this world, which that's what the world and what sin will do. And in that moment, the father sees his son and the Bible says that he ran to his son and he kissed him on his neck. It was a shame for the patriarch to run because he would have to pull up his garments and show his legs, which was a shame in that culture. And he ran to his son and he hugged him, a filthy son. Hugged him and kissed him. And he stinks and he put a ring on his hand. He put shoes on his feet. All of it symbolic and beautiful in and of itself. And he, put, and he said, told his servants, go and get the best robe. Where do you think, who do you think had the best robe? The father. He gave his own robe. And he goes home and he kills the fatted calf. And he says, he says we will celebrate for my son was lost, but now he has found the younger brother. But the story doesn't end there. Jesus goes on to tell this story. And remember the context. What brought this on? It was Pharisees that came. And they were making this accusation that Jesus said, Why do you eat with publicans and prostitutes and sinners? And Jesus goes on and says, and while the, this celebration is going on, the elder brother sat outside and was angry. And when the father approached him, he said, he said, I've done everything that you've asked me to do. I, he went and wasted. In fact, he doesn't even call him his brother. He says, your son wasted the inheritance. Do you know what this guy was really upset about? It's because the inheritance that was entitled to the younger brother had already been spent. And all these resources that were given him, the ring, the shoes, the robe, the fatted calf, all of this was what was entitled to the elder brother. And he was angry. And he said, I've done all of this and you haven't even killed a small little heifer for me. What was the gist here? What was the struggle? The struggle is, is that both sons were lost. The difference is one went and indulged in the world. The other was lost and he was sitting right under the nose of the father. The problem was, is neither one of the sons... Wanted the father. They wanted what he could give them. We see reconciliation with the younger brother. But Jesus, because of his audience, left it open. We don't know if the elder brother repented. He said, Father, you're right. I was wrong of being selfish. I tell you that story, but I want to bring something up to this point. Because Jesus is the great elder brother in Hebrews 2. Do you know that it was the responsibility of the elder brother to make sure that the father's name was not demoralized or hindered in the community? The elder brother was supposed to leave and go get his younger brother. He was supposed to go and say, no, this isn't what we're supposed to be doing. This isn't right. In this time when he was being taken advantage of by the, by the world, the elder brother was supposed to go and stand in between him and the world. But the, the, this parable was a parable of, yes, a weak younger brother. 
really a bad older brother. But that's not what Jesus did. It says that Jesus became man and he suffered and died so that he could call us his brothers and his sisters. And Jesus was the good elder brother and he stood in between death. He stood in between sin. He stood in between the wrath of God for us. And it says, as the Old Testament says, he declares us his siblings. Jesus is a great champion. Jesus is a great and the greater elder brother. But he gives us one more and we'll hasten. Lastly, he's the great high priest. In, seven, in verse 17, it says, Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. Now, this immediately catches the attention, remember, of the audience. They know high priest. They know the sacrificial system. They know that every year there had to be, and that every, that every moment of every day there were atonements being made. But every year, in particular, there was one that was made for Israel. And that this high priest would go in and he had to make sure everything was right. All was in order, including his spirit, including his mind. Because when he walked in, to the Holy of Holies, and he would make that sacrifice. He would go in. Remember, they would tie the rope because if he died, they had to have a way to pull him out. No sin. He'd come in with a spotless lamb, and he would make the sacrifice and sprinkle the blood, and then he would leave. As Matt emphasized in our first study, the Bible says in Hebrews that Jesus went and sit. He sat down in the Holy of Holies signifying that it's done. There's no more sacrifices. They can set up, they can, they can build a temple. They can have all, they can start raising the heifers. They can, they can do all of that. There is no need for any more sacrifices because Jesus is the great high priest, merciful and faithful. So, so he's a great champion. He's the great elder brother. He's the great high priest. And I recognize we could spend, we could spend so much time and going back and just really laying that out. But, but there, there's a lot of that that's really coming in the book of Hebrews. But I'm plagued with the question, why did Jesus do all this? What was the purpose of all of this? In verse 14, it says this, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. Jesus came to destroy the devil, to destroy him, to destroy his power. Number two, he came to deliver us from death. In verse 15, it says, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. He came and delivered us from death. We just sang it, all trembling death. Where is your sting? There is no sting because of a resurrected, resurrected Savior. Number three, to give glory to God. It said this, to become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. He did this to give glory and honor to God in humble submission to him. And then number four, to save sinners. At the end of 17, to make a propitiation for the sins of the people. Propitiation is a, is a two-part act that involves appeasing the wrath of an offended person and being reconciled to him. In the New Testament, the act of propitiation 
always refers to the work of God and not the sacrifices or gifts offered by man. The reason for this is that man is totally incapable of satisfying God's justice except by spending an eternity in hell. There's no service, no sacrifice, or gift that a man can offer that will appease the holy wrath of God and satisfy, satisfy his perfect justice. Can I read to you um, parts of Romans chapter 3? Where believers in Christ have been justified freely by his grace through redemption. That is in Christ Jesus whom God set forth as the propitiation by his blood. Through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because of the forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. We see this in the first three chapters of Romans. Paul makes the argument that everyone, Jews and Gentiles alike, are under condemnation of God, deserving of his wrath. Everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us deserve wrath and punishment. God, in his infinite grace and mercy, has provided a way for God's wrath to be appeased, and we can be reconciled unto him. The wonderful truth of the gospel is that Christians are saved from God's wrath and reconciled to God, not because, as 1 John says, not because we loved him, but because he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the finish it, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The only way... God's wrath against sinful man can be appeased is by Jesus Christ. He saves sinners. He came to destroy the devil. Now I know sometimes we have the cartoon figure of the devil. And sometimes we run the risk to either give him too much power or we minimize him. Let's don't be guilty of, some, of a theological error of some type of equal dualism. There's an evil God and a good God. He is totally subordinate to God. He is, he's, there's not even, if there, there, we, to even say that there's a different level of playing field is to imply that he's even in comparison to God. He is not. But we need to take the devil seriously. Keller makes the argument because some say, oh, now you're getting, you know, you're, you're an angels. You left angels for a while. Now you're talking about the devil. And some people believe that to be, oh, we're talking more spiritual things now. And that's not really, really for me. But I will tell you this, that it takes the reality around us tells us there is a devil. In fact, some may be able to make the argument that it takes more faith to believe in God than it does to believe in the devil. And the reason we say that, and I'm talking about believing in the existence of God. And the reason we say that is because depravity is all around us. War, sickness, the stains of sin is all around us. Death is a validation of his very existence. Do not take the devil lightly. The great equalizer in life is death. And I'll tell you today, don't take death lightly. Too often times, we, we, we don't think of death, but it is appointed unto man, every man, to die. And after that, the judgment. We live in light of death, but we should not live in fear of death. We shouldn't take the glory of God lightly. Everything we do, Paul said, is for the glory of God. And everything that Jesus did, including his suffering, including his sacrificial atonement for your sin, was for the glory of God. Nothing is too small to give God glory. Nothing is too great to give him, not to give him glory. And don't Take lightly that we are sinners. Don't take that lightly. 
I think sometimes, you know, we, we fall into, especially with children. I have found myself at times, maybe Jaden or Jordan had done something a little mischievous, maybe even had told what is called a white lie. And maybe the way they did it, I kind of chuckle or something like that away. But we need to understand that even in those moments of children who, who look so sweet, those are the sins that put Jesus on the cross. And we don't need to take sin lightly. Jesus came to save sinners. Now, as we close, I don't know if any of you um, ever heard the account from the 1960s of Kitty Genovese. She lived in in the neighborhood in a neighborhood in Queens, New York, and and it was on March 13th, 1964, in the latter part of the night, just as she had ever done before. She came home from a late shift at work. She was 28 years old, and she was approaching her apartment in eyes distance. And she was approached and assaulted by Winston Mosley. This lady struggled. She fought as hard as she could. But she was overpowered and she screamed to her lungs while she was being stabbed across the street from where she lived. She screamed so loudly and made so much noise to the point that there were residents in the upward apartments that heard her. And to see what was going on, they cut their lights on, opened their windows. And numerous people looked out their windows down into the street to see what was going on. It was originally reported, but it had been disputed, that there were 38 witnesses that attested to seeing her being assaulted, being stabbed, mugged. Because of this, these lights turning on and these windows opening and these heads peeking out, the assailant, Winston Mosley, backed off and then went and hid. The residents watched as the beaten and stabbed Kitty crawled to seek safety in an alley. But no one came down to aid her. In fact, not one person called the police. Not only were the residents watching, but Winston Mosley was also watching what was going on. Who then, recognizing that no one was coming to the aid of this woman, no one was coming to protect her, pursued her once more in the alley and proceeded to murder her and steal $49.67. You say, Blake, why do you tell us that? Because that's not the gospel. And that's not what Jesus did. See, other religions paint this picture of a God who just sits and sees all that is going on and does nothing about it. But Jesus turned on the light, saw the injustice, and came down and rescued us from the enemy. Oh, the gospel is so powerful. And today, in these, uh, these few verses that are left, we find in verse 16 that we need help. If you're lost today, if you don't believe in the gospel, if you haven't, if you haven't wholeheartedly embraced the lordship of Christ, you need to hear this today. Verse 16 says, For surely it is not angels that he helps. Do you know why? They don't need help. It's done. There are angels that are in need of salvation, but their destiny has been sealed. They don't need help. It says, but he helps the offspring 
of Abraham. He, he helps man. So you need to understand today, you need help. But verse 18 says, only Jesus can help. For because he himself also suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. You say, Blake, what is the gist of these nine verses? It's this. Jesus, at an infinite cost, came down from heaven to save you. And he alone can save you. And God the Father alone deserves the glory. And all God's people said,